This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Thank you so much. Welcome to Tao Unbound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. I'm your host, Ido Aharoni, and I'm so happy to have with us today Ronit Sachi Fainao, Professor Ronit Sachi Fainao, who's the head of the Center for the Research of Cancer at Tel Aviv University and a notable scientist herself. Today, we will talk all about, about all those things that, that you're doing. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Ido. First question I have for you, obviously, when I, when I saw your name, I said, wow, that's an interesting name. Sachi Fainaro, a combination. So tell us a little bit about, about the background, where this name comes from. So my maiden name is Sachi, and it comes from Bulgaria. And both my parents were born in Bulgaria just uh, before, during the war, the Second World War II. And the, the Sachi comes uh, actually from 500 years ago when we were uh, welcomed out uh, of Spain. And Sachi is Seat, is an hour. It's the uh, clock maker that uh, when uh, Spain was under the Ottomanic uh, regime, so they called up according to their profession. And so, apparently so they were uh, jewelers and... Uh, so you come from a long line of families that came originally from Spain, yes. were forced to leave Spain because of the Inquisition, mm -hmm. and their occupation had something to do with making clocks and, and watches. That's why they got their name. At least to one, one side, my father's side, and my mom's side was Arroyo. Arroyo is a river, and yes. that's from Enfinci, so they go way back So these are Spain. two very prominent Spanish mm -hmm. names. Arroyo, actually, is a very common name in Latin America and Spain among non-Jews, probably of Jewish background. It means a river, so it was either according to the location or according to the profession that they were called the, at the time. Yes, that's that's. Now, are you are you related to the famous Saatchi family in England? <laughs> that's a funny story because I did my PhD in London, uh, in UCL, and uh, while doing so, I got a letter from Maurice Saatchi, from the Saatchi and Saatchi, one of the two brothers. And he asked me where I am located at the tree, the family tree. And I called my mom in Israel and asked her, are we related to this guy? And she said, uh, unfortunately for you, no, but <laughs> tell him you're willing to be adopted. <laughs> so probably... 500 years ago, they also left uh, Spain and willingly, but they left to Iraq. So right. the two more, uh, brothers, Sachi brothers from Sachi and Sachi, are Iraqi that moved, immigrated right. that, to, to the UK. That's, that's the, the, the thing that I know about the name, mm -hmm. that it's a, a, an Iraqi name, but now you're telling me it's actually originally from, from Spain. Spain, and your family is from Bulgaria, which is another story. We can have a whole podcast mm -hmm. about the Bulgarian Jews. So where were you raised in Israel? I was actually raised in Venezuela, Venezuela. not in Israel. Okay. <laughs> I, I was born in Israel, but raised in Venezuela with my parents. We went there, uh, myself and my, my brother, who is two years older than me. And we lived there for six years. And we, we came back uh, when I was uh, 12, 12, 13. So Spanish, obviously, yes. is, uh, it's like a native language yes. for you. Yes, and uh, and I'm sure that's um, it's unique because uh, you know we're we're used to people in Israel that Israel is a francophone country, so there mm -hmm. there are 750,000 people in Israel that their first language is French, and then obviously mm -hmm. over one million people their first language is Russian, and nearly two million people that their first language is Arabic. And um, how many people we have that their first language is Spanish? I don't know. Probably in the hundreds of thousands, right? Maybe 300,000. Probably. I, I don't know, but uh, I guess so. Spanish but, but, and, and Bulgarian, because it used to be my parents' secret language so that their children will not understand. And we ended up understanding everything when you hear that at home all the time, yes. Now, the, the Jews of Bulgaria are known uh, for, you know, they settled in the southern 
suburbs of mm, Tel Aviv, Jaffa. mostly mm-hmm. in, in what's called Diafo, Batiam, Cholon, those areas. Where were you raised in Israel so, when you came back from Venezuela? M- my grandparents uh, actually were in Jaffa. They, my grandfather, until the age of 100, uh, cheered for Maccabi Yafo. Of course. Kabilio Yafo now. So it was, uh, I think, all the Bulgarians in Yafo, all the Bulgarians in general, Jewish Bulgarians, were uh, rooting for, for their uh, team. And from my mom's side, they came to Haifa with, a, with the boat. I mean, they had a, both have amazing stories of how they traveled. They took a whole year in uh, 48 after the war. And my mom was two years old and the, all, the, all the way until they got so... My grandmother spoke 12 languages, my wow. grandfather 13, something like that. So they, they passed a lot uh, throughout their lives, but uh, amazing lives. I think wow. we are quite spoiled uh, these days. So, so your family roots in Israel are both Haifa and Tel Aviv and Yafo. That's, mm-hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. And, and so when did you know, when did you discover that, that science is your thing? This is your passion. This is going to be your future. Uh, the fact that it was uh, going to be my future, that uh, came really late in my life. Uh, unlike most scientists that know from the age of four that they are going to be scientists or clinicians, um, I was always interested in science. I was studying uh, physics, mathematics and chemistry in uh, high school. But this was something that I did along the way. Uh, I was dancing classical ballet. I was a professional dancer at the time, and uh, I continued until the almost the end of my postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard. So I continued until I had my first uh, child. And so, do you see, by the way, a connection between ballet and and science? Absolutely. Tell us a little bit. Tell us more about it. Well, I think especially uh, classical ballet um, is very analytical. And at the same time, it's very creative. So both things, self-discipline, creativity, innovation, analytical, you can really time and calculate everything that you do. And one of the things that I most like until today about uh, dance is that you are totally immersed into it. So when you do that, unlike uh, I I run uh, 10Ks, uh, even with my lab today, um, you can do many things. You can think about many things while doing so. When you swim, when you, but when you dancing ballet, you have to be very concentrated only on the things that you do right now. And and I I find it fascinating, and it's very similar to many things. That so it's, it's it's methodological, but requires creativity at the same time because you have to uh, plan everything in advance and and react to to things. And then I I think mm-hmm. that's a very interesting concept uh, because. That's one of the things that we don't, uh, that it's very difficult for people to understand is the abstract connections between things like art and science. And, and I think it's beautiful. So, so when did you decide to study, um, you know, to, to become a, uh, a clinical expert? Well, I, I think it was a process. Uh, first, Starting with classical ballet is, uh, I think, like all classical arts, even music and other arts uh, that are classical, they are very unforgiving. You don't, you don't have shortcuts, and everything has to be perfect. And with time, uh, when I moved to to London to do my PhD, I I was at the Royal Opera Ballet at the time, and and during my PhD, and slowly I went more to the modern uh, ballet dancing. Uh, which is less, <laughs> more uh, more forgiving, we'll say, and uh, less disciplined. Less disciplined, yeah. Most more. more uh, um, I I wouldn't say easier. It's all. It also requires a lot of uh, self discipline, but uh, completely different. It's more abstract, more open to new ideas, new rhythm. Uh, it's less uh, structured, uh, similar to. If we compare classical music uh, and and modern music, uh, so with time I, I I understood that for me, uh, even though I really appreciate and, and get inspired by great choreographers, I knew that for me the thing was to do, 
not to teach, not to be the one that uh, teaches others to do, but I wanted to be myself, the, the artist. And it's very limited. It has an expiry date and uh, the expiry date is very early in life uh, that uh, from that moment on, uh, whenever any sports or, or art that considers our body has a, a very clear uh, age time limit that you, you can be that. So in parallel, I continued... Uh, my physics, chemistry, and mathematics, and then on, uh, I went to to study pharmacology at the Hebrew University, and uh, from there I I continued my with my scientific career, thinking that I can forever continue in parallel, but then uh, I had less and less time for the art part and more into the science, and I think I I stopped performing and and when I had my first child, yeah. You you studied chemistry biology, physics, you went on to get a degree in pharmacology, and then you go to London, you get your PhD. What was it about? So my PhD was on nanotechnology, a really new theme at the time, and polymer chemistry. So All I right, was so, so keep in mind, we're being watched right now by hundreds of people mm -hmm. that don't know much about polymer chemistry. Try to make it, to simplify it, what is it? Okay, so the combination of polymer chemistry and nanotechnology is creating this uh, small structure nano, at the nanoscale. That means 10 to the minus 9 of a meter. If you take it uh, in comparison, it's like a tennis ball to planet Earth is nanometer. To, so just to get it... Very small. Very small. <laughs> But it is very small to us. In the na looking at it in the naked eyes, obviously we cannot see it, but for the blood vessels in our body, that's quite a large molecule. So imagine like sort of balls, little balls that their diameter is 100 nanometer, and they circulate in our blood system after injecting them, and they cannot leave the blood system, our circulation, but then when they arrive to a cancer tissue, the Blood vessels are defective there. So imagine a tube with holes instead of being a clear, smooth tube. And now they can leave the blood vessel through these holes and reach specifically and selectively to the cancer tissue and not to any normal tissue. And I was amazed and fascinated by this technology at the time. It, as I said, it was very novel. Now everyone is talking about nanotechnology. But the idea that we can deliver chemotherapy in a stealth manner like the airplane so our body doesn't see it because it continues in the blood circulation but then it can live from the blood system and leave the blood vessel and enter only at those leaky vessels that have those holes in the cancer tissue that means that we can put inside these balls like a magic bullet chemotherapy that is associated with a, a lot of side effects because when they reach the normal organs, they cause devastating effects like the boldness and the, the nausea and everything that happens to our uh, immune system that uh, we become very prone to infections. And all this is because the classical chemotherapy comes to kill cells that divide rapidly but they don't have an address. These are cells that divide rapidly and our cancer cells as opposed to normal cells like our hair follicles that divide rapidly or right. our cells of the, the red blood cells or white blood cells. So I, I was really amazed that we can take it and like a missile, take it with an address, with a ways and, and send it only to the cancer tissue without having all these side effects, which is the main limiting uh, dose that we can that dictates how much we can give of the chemotherapy. Now, there is, uh, I know this, um, that, that there is a very delicate dance that cancer patients have to engage after therapy, after chemo or, or any other form of therapy. On the one hand, the, the medical staff has to boost their immune system. On the other hand, they have to suppress the, the immune system so that it will not damage the existing organs because, as you said, the, 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 the new immune system or the reinvigorated immune system doesn't know 
that they're uh, they're not supposed to attack the kidney. They're not supposed to attack the liver. Right. Right. So how do we achieve that balance? So now you're taking me uh, 15 years after my PhD. And uh, this is exactly the subject of the 2018 Nobel Prize uh, award that was granted to Jim Allison and Sanju Kohonjo on immunotherapy. And that was exactly what you're saying now. It was the idea that our immune system is, is a double-edged sword. So on one hand, we want the immune system to come and do its job to attack cancer cells, the same as it attacks any bacteria, any pathogen, any bacteria, any virus. And, and we all know about viruses in the last three years. So we expect it to do that. But many times uh, the cancer cells are way too smart. So they have like the Harry Potter gown that they uh, become like stealth to our immune system. So they do not attack the, the cancer cell. So one thing is to take the gown off the, the cancer cells and expose them to the immune system so they can attack. But the reason I said that they, they are double-edged sword is because sometimes or, or many times, almost always at some point it happens, it's all a question when it will happen, instead of attacking the cancer cell, they become allies of the cancer cell and the inflammation that occurs in cancer tissues and there is always inflammation in a cancer tissue, actually helps them. They hijack, the cancer cells hijack the normal functions of the immune cells that are supposed to come and attack the tissue or the pathogen and bring new blood vessels so they can bring oxygen and nutrients to the area to cure the wound, as to heal the wound. But in the case of cancer, when you bring them new blood vessel supply, so you bring them oxygen and nutrients, they actually start proliferate even faster and they start migrating. So now they create also not only growing mass, they also send some cells to other organs. And this is metastasis. And, and so it's a connection. delicate balance. Right. And what you're saying is the connection that was discovered by, by many scientists about b between sugar and and the uh, and the growth and the rapid growth of, of mm -hmm. cancer in in uh, so that's that's um, that extremely that's extremely in interesting and so in your center so tell us about the center that you're heading what are the main areas of, of concentration so my mm, the lab I'm heading is concentrated on cancer research combined with nanotechnology how to deliver these either known chemotherapies or targeted therapies. And lately we created these nanovaccines in the last, uh, lately, seven years. We created these nanovaccines that are, it's nanoparticles that boost the immune system to remind them what they have to do in order to attack the cancer cells. And the, and the way we do it is using 3D printing where we print the human cancer tissue. So we come to the surgery room uh, when a patient is operated, we take a piece of that tissue, we take alongside also the MRI, we do the image analysis of that tumor in the patient's brain, for example. And according to that, we had even an architect in the lab that uh, converted the files from the MRI to files that a 3D printer can read. And now taking the tissue itself, we, in a way, destroy it. We create a suspension, a solution or full with cells. So it's no longer only cancer cells on a dish, on a two-dimension plastic dish. That has nothing to do with the actual organ where it came from. And not surprisingly, 95% of the compounds that are tested in clinical trials fail eventually and do not get the approval of the FDA or European Medicine Agency. So we wanted to improve those chances of a drug to get approved at the end and to help the patients. So we created this 3D printed tissue, but we don't create only one. We create 100 replicas of mini tumors that are similar and originating from the cells of that patient. And now we have a high throughput system that we can test many different drugs and we can know within two weeks if a certain drug or a combination, a cocktail of drugs is likely to inhibit that uh, cancer growth. And then we actually save six months of try and error where 
we give the standard of care and then we find out that that patient is not sensitive to that therapy. And six months is a lot of time. So we lose a lot of time. It's a lot of money many times when we talk about the new drugs, the biologicals, the antibodies. So if we can prevent using the wrong drug on the wrong patient and predict which drug is most likely to, to work on that uh, tumor within two weeks, this is the time anyhow you need some time after the surgery to recover, then we ho can hopefully fit better the treatment to the patient, uh, to that specific patient. So, so we're doing now a clinical trial, 80 so, patients. So this brings up two questions. The first is, um, and obviously what you're talking about is apparently the future of medicine, You're talking about customized medicine, basically. Every every patient, you know, requires a, a different kind of treatment. Uh, two questions that come to mind. The first is, what needs to happen in order to turn this into a scalable operation, right? That's the first one. Second, what do you do with a cancer that is not necessarily a tumor, like blood cancer? So blood cancer is still a tumor. It's not a solid tumor. It's hematological. And actually for hematological malignancies, those blood cancers, we are in, in many cases, we are way better. So when I w did my postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital Boston, the numbers were, the percent was 90% failed therapy for leukemia, for example. Today, 90% survive. So this is actually one of the success stories thanks to the advancement in technology and medicine and new therapies and sequencing, what we didn't have uh, before. So we so know... Wait, tell us about sequencing. What is sequencing? So in 2000, the year of 2000, there was the human, the sequencing, genome sequencing that right. started the whole project. And then in 2010, they started sequencing uh, cancer. And for, since then, every year we get a different tumor type. There are 300 is, tumor types. So it's the mapping of, of our DNA. Of our genome, yes. Of our genome. And now we get way more results than we can actually fit because we find out of thousands of genes uh, that change, mutate with cancer compared to normal. So we had to map first, and this is the genome project that was in 2000 published, what is the normal? And then you know what deviates from normal in a cancer tissue, but then you get a lot of hits. There are a lot of genes that mutate, that change with cancer, and they change all the time. So it's not a single change usually. And we don't have drugs that target each one of these changes. So there are about 30 drugs today. That is an amazing number compared to 20 years ago. But still, it's not a lot. There are way more mutations that we get from sequencing that cancer, any cancer for that matter. So we, we are advanced a lot. There is still much room for improvement. But this really helped to define what is the appropriate drug for an appropriate mutation in a certain cancer tissue. And now we're starting even wider looking at systems biology. That means that we look at the whole network. So it's not a single gene because many genes change in cancer to see how we can map all the changes. And then what we do after sequencing the tumor, we test it in our case on our 100 tumors. So we have several combinations that we cannot predict in advance which one will be the best. So we try several of them that make sense according to the sequencing. And then what we're doing now is a clinical trial of 80 patients that will see it to validate our technology, to see that really each tumor and what happened in the dish. So we know the answer within two weeks, but then we wait for four or six months until that patient that cannot be his own control. So he, he gets only one treatment. We, wait for the MRI or the CT. We see if he's, whether he improved or not, as long as it correlates to what we got on the dish, it's a good outcome. In so, so you need it to be compatible with your lab results. Yes. What happens in, 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 in reality. Yeah. Now, you said 80 patients, and let's say that the clinical trials, God willing, will be positive. What happens next? So it's exactly your first question. So we, then we need to scale it up to be able to 
print very quickly at the moment we print like 100 on one patient so that we can have several tumors and, and to print them and, and in parallel test many drugs on, on all of them following the sequencing. So I think that will be the challenge at that point. But I think the connection again with art, with architecture, it's way more than testing just the cancer cells because on, on a plastic, because we have the whole three dimension, we have the microenvironment, we print even the blood vessels so we can flow the immune system of that patient. So we're taking everything in account, what we missed for 20, 30 years on testing just on cancer cells and getting the wrong results. So what are your needs as a lab going forward? Uh, we have many people listening to us uh, right now that are connected to the university and have a relationship with the university. Many of them are looking for ways to help the university. Um, what are the things that you need as a lab going forward? So I'll, I'll say maybe first the things that I'm very happy with, which are the students. There are magnificent students in Tel Aviv University. It's a multidisciplinary environment. We have nine faculties and with the Faculty of Medicine, we have 17 affiliated hospitals. So we have, this is a huge collaborative effort that is in my own lab, but also on the Cancer Biology Research Center that I'm heading that encompasses more or less 400 people from the different faculties on campus and the physicians, so not only oncologists, it's also the surgeons, the pathologists, the radiologists, all of them. So it's a great center that brings together all the great scientists and physicians together and the, and the students. So this is something that we build upon. And what we are missing is probably better infrastructure. So we, we have each one of us get his own, her own grants and that we can buy a piece of equipment and a microscope and, and imaging facilities. But I think if we had for the center, now it's a virtual center, but if it was a real center with all the facilities that we need so we can share a place to meet together and a place that we can have all the equipment together, uh, it will be much more productive in terms of not buying each one his own equipment, but rather sharing also the facility, the infrastructure. So what you're saying is that despite of the this hybrid uh, system that was introduced post-COVID, uh, uh, that people, you know, work virtually, you say in, in your field of cancer research, uh, you still need to have that uh, Real love. <laughs> physical... physical um, congregation, you mm -hmm. need people to congregate around a certain issue and try to solve it together. It exactly. still has to I, be. I, a I think even from my own experience as a student, and and even today that I'm more established and have my network of of collaborators, the best ideas came from the coffee breaks in in conferences. So when you sit in a Zoom conference and and you give your talk, it's not the same like meeting after your talk with the students and the, your collaborators and new people that you didn't even know that are doing exactly the same thing or something completely different that can be complementary and, and exchange ideas. So I think a, a place like that, that that helps the connections between the different faculties and the clinicians all together and, and having the infrastructure as a joint infrastructure of equipment, because yes, we, we can analyze the data at home, but this is still very much a lab, wet lab work that we need to be in in the lab. Now, every person, and this is a, a bit of a philosophical question, every person is connected to cancer. I don't know one person that is not, mm -hmm. whether it's themselves directly or someone they know. And so what can you tell us about the future of cancer treatment um, in terms of the ability of of civilization to to eradicate this disease to because cancer by itself means nothing it's an abstract word right cancer is thousands of different diseases now you're telling me more than thousands possibly tens of tens of thousands well today there are defined pathologically is 300 but each one as you say has its own subtypes and it's very different while 
probably the only common denominator is the loss of control on the division of cells. So they, there is nobody there to tell them stop div dividing and stop uh, going to other tissues. So yes, I, I think that it's a bit of a big word to say eradicate cancer, as, uh, as you mentioned, but uh, I think we can certainly some of them, and there is, as, as I said, with leukemia, certain types of leukemia, we did get very positive results uh, in the last the last 20 years with the advancements of technology. It always goes together in, in parallel. But also, I think we understand better. So whether it is the microbiome, not only in our gut, but also in the cancer tissues. So we know what are the fungi and the, the bacteria that is involved and how it dictates not only the way the cancer will progress, but also the way cancer tissue will respond to therapies. So maybe we can use a simple antibiotic that we already have in the repertoire and use it on a certain cancer. So a lot about this uh, uh, connectivity between the different fields uh, with microbiology, chemistry, biology, medicine, uh, and engineering can really advance the, the field. Uh, but for that, if we get to cancer to be cancer without disease, meaning a, a manageable, uh, even if it's chronic, it will be manageable disease, like we live with uh, diabetes, with like What dyspnea, happened with, with, uh, with HIV. Exactly. So I think in some cases it will be eradicated. In others, if we can manage uh, living with it in a, in a healthy manner, living with a high quality of life. I'm not no. speaking about devastating side effects, but... Something like those nanotechnologies that are much safer or immunotherapy, that will make uh, the, the prediction of our future much better. Now, another question I have for you. Uh, COVID-19 was a big trauma. Luckily, the scientific community, through an unprecedented collaborative effort, was able to respond very quickly. And what needed is fast regulation. Do you think that um, the regulator will continue this open-minded approach post-COVID-19 going forward? Yes, I think that there was a, a radical change in our mindset. Having said that, we have to remember that this was a global effort fighting a global pandemic. So everything else was put aside and uh, many clinical trials of other fields that even cancer that are not, were not related to COVID, uh, were put on hold. So we cannot continue living like that, but certainly in my field of RNA therapeutics, delivering a messenger RNA, like in the COVID vaccine, in my case, for cancer, although we took the same technology, the same platform technology and used it for COVID as well, but uh, or to express a certain protein or to, to educate the immune system or to silence a certain gene so it will not express the protein, it, it's using nanotechnology. And this is, was what uh, was used both for Moderna, BioNTech and Pfizer. So the regulator learned how to deal with these complex medicines. So it's no longer small molecules that are uh, very easy to manufacture. It's more complex, but the regulator learned how to deal with it. The N NIH, National Institute of Health, devised the nanotechnology characterization lab. So now they can prepare a clear dossier for the FDA that can translate it better in terms of the regulation, uh, regulatory efforts, rather than just clear manufacturing of antibodies or small molecules. Now, rightly or wrongly, the general public has a very bad image of the regulator. Uh, they think it's unnecessarily overly bureaucratic. Uh, they think that their agendas uh, coming in from the commercial world, meaning the pharma industry, that affect. Um, is there some anything you know, comforting, reassuring that you can tell us about the world of regulation, the world of, of those entities that approve clinical trials and approve medications and so on? Well, absolutely. As uh, 
Well, first, in the last four years, I'm on the board of directors of Teva Pharmaceuticals. And beside that, I also founded and spinned off uh, several of the technologies to, to new biotech startups. So now I see the other side. So it's very easy to sit on your uh, scientist seat and, and criticize that everything is too slow. But when you come to the other side, you understand that things are very complicated and you have to take care of safety. And it has to be a, a very clear and uh, structured process and all the boring bureaucratic words that that we can easily say now that ah oh, look at covid it was so fast and so easy no there were billions and billions of dollars that were invested on one certain virus and on one technology or several technologies that uh, went on and and all the offers all the clinical trials as i said went on just to focus on that imagine that a regulatory point of view you have to be open to all the different platform technologies and each one they also study especially the new ones that I'm talking about so it has to be a, a clear process but together with that there is room for improvement uh, for openness for innovation for creativity and and I think in that term COVID helped a lot if I, I mean it had devastating effects but it also I think we grew from it for some other positive uh, beyond collaborative efforts also in terms of being open to new technologies well professor Sachi Fainao um, you're, you're leaving us with a very optimistic message uh, we learned a lot from you about the future of customized medicine and about the importance of uh, immunotherapy, about the importance of preventive medicine, and about the connection between ballet and science, which I think is fascinating. And actually, we will invite you to another conversation just about that, about the connection between ballet and science. I wanted to thank you for being with us. Thank you, Ido. And to you, our listeners and our viewers, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. And until the next episode, goodbye from Tel Aviv. This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Thank you.